That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. Let the female creature go. Every duck's got his limit, and you scum have pushed me over the line. Jimmy, do you like to see what I see? A talking duck? Yeah, that's it. Uh, I've been doing too much toot. Uh, Why <laughs> No one laughs at a master of quack fool. Welcome everyone, this is episode 39 of the Comics Emotion Podcast. I am Chris Phelps as always, and my co-host and good friend is Mr. Dave Horrocks. Hi, right, Chris. <laughs> wow, Dave. Sorry, I thought I'd throw you off your game a little bit straight <laughs> off the bat. Yeah, just a little bit. Hi guys, hi Chris. Welcome to the Comics in Motion Podcast. What we like to do here is we like to review media like movies, TV shows, and games that are based on comic books. Myself, I'll be reviewing the media mainly from the perspective of a long-time comic book reader. And my co-host Chris will be reviewing mainly from that media perspective. And we'll walk through our given choice of the week and give our thoughts on it. What we also like to do is we also like to spoil everything that we review. So if you haven't watched our choice of the week, then I'd advise you to maybe pause the podcast, go and watch it, and then come back and have a listen then. Although, what I don't normally say is, probably you don't need to this week. (laughs) (laughs) But you have to kind of lose it. If you don't, don't mind being spoiled and you haven't seen this, probably listen to the podcast first as a health warning, quite honestly. so Yeah, and before we review it, I would definitely, don't spoil the health, just listen to the podcast, that's all you need, because it's at this point I'm thinking, I wish I'd just listened to a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, just a bit of news from this week then, and a potential Avengers 4 spoiler, yep. but... So uh, if you want to fast forward maybe a couple of minutes, if you don't want to hear this, it's not really a spoiler. It's a bit of speculation, but Chris Evans, we kind of knew he was finishing up with the, with the whole Marvel franchise, but he's kind of officially come out now and said, you know, he's loved his time uh, playing this role, but you know, it's, it's now an end. So it may mean that he just killed off. It may mean he walks off into the sunset. But um, I mean, how how do you feel about that? How do you think he's done as a as the Captain America, Steve Rogers? I like him to be honest, Dave. I saw that myself on Twitter yesterday, saying like it's been eight great years and thanks everybody. I think he's good. I think he's good. And and to be fair, having watched Infinity War again, I know the four moment when he comes down and takes everyone out at Wakanda. You know, like all the, all the sort of henchmen and stuff. Of Thanos, but that, that moment when Captain America comes and saves Vision as well, he's really good in Scotland. That's a really good yeah. moment. That you know, with the music and everything, and I've, I've appreciated that a bit over the last few weeks. So, no, I like him, I do like it. I love the scene in the lift as well when he's uh, fighting with everyone in, in uh, Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier, yeah, yeah, that's a great thing yeah. As well. so he knows it's going to kick off, but no, I think he's good. I think he's good, and I think. It could be a curveball, Dave, because we've had this. They don't tweet these things out for nothing. So, you know, we, the speculation is that the, the, you know, spoilers again, guys, that the, all the original Avengers survive to start this film, as we know, and then they're the ones that die at the end to sacrifice, only for the next load. So we'll see. We'll see. But, yeah, I, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I, th- I think I'm sure I've mentioned it in the past in the comics. There's a couple of candidates who could pick up that, Captain America mantle in the in the MCU. So one is Bucky Barnes, so the Winter Soldier, and the other one is Sam Wilson, so the Falcon. So both of those guys had picked up and and been Captain America in the comics. So so they could go that direction, but but let's see. I I agree. I think he's done a great job, and and you know he is he does my head in. He's such a tasty dish of a bloke, isn't he? You know he's got everything, um, but he's a brilliant actor as well. You know, in the different roles in the other movies that he's done, I, I always think he puts in a, a great performance. And when it was first announced that there was going to be a Captain America movie, I was utterly unenthused about it. But honestly, he's, he's one of my favorite characters in the MCU today. Yeah, no, good stuff, Dave. You got anything else for us, Dave, news wise? Yeah, so we've got the Daredevil uh, Series 3 trailer. So I'm pretty excited about that. We've got, uh, this is going to be back to the Kingpin and Daredevil again. So a bit more like 
uh, series one. You know, in series two, we had a lot of the Punisher, didn't we? But uh, we're going to have Vincent D'Onofrio. I think he's going to come back bigger and badder, and he's really going to break Daredevil down. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that one. No, I, I must admit as well, in the bits I've seen, he's actually got the famous white jacket on as well, Dave, which is, which yeah. is a, with the old cravat job. So he's definitely going full Kingpin on this one. So I, I love him. I absolutely love Kingpin. I think he's he's such a good actor as well. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to it. As you know, I absolutely love Daredevil. So I'm all over this when it comes out, definitely. Yeah. And the last thing just to mention, so the Harley Quinn animated series trailer came out this week and it is quite amusing. They poke a little bit of fun at Deadpool. And so there is a little bit of tit for tat there, <laughs> but that, that looks like, you know, it's, it's animated, but it might be a little bit more adult focused. Um, but certainly uh, I'm sure that will be popular. I, I think, of the two big publishers, you know, you basically got Deadpool across on the on the um, Marvel side and Harley Quinn on the DC side. They they just seem to be in the last decade the most popular characters, you know, and they they're just cash cows basically. So, so yeah, I, I look kind of looking forward to that one. I know I, I'll have to vet it first to see if it really is a bit more adult. If it's not, I mean, my girls will just be well up for that they they love the harley quinn character they just can't unfortunately watch most of what she's in <laughs> <laughs> but we can dave yeah yeah yeah. so um i believe you've got a few reviews dave yeah so we haven't read out some itunes reviews for a uh, for a few weeks and just so so people know so we we were discussing that we don't actually know because obviously you get these things through in itunes which is absolutely brilliant so if you do like the show please I, i'd invite you to just go across head across to itunes and drop us a five-star review that's absolutely fantastic but in the last few episodes i mean we haven't read them out and so i just wanted to get back but what we don't know is how people actually sound so um chris do you want to have a go at, at reading out a review and and uh, in an in an accent that you think it might sound like, of course. Now the first review, Dave, is from uh, is titled "Brilliant" and it's from Mum and Stacy, which is uh, in brackets, which is from Rough Giraffe. So we can't thank them enough for their uh, fantastic review. And it goes a little something like this: If a comic has become a film or game, then these guys will cover it. They know what they're talking about without excluding non-comic fans. A must listen for comic fans. And that's a fantastic review, ladies. Thank you very much. Dave, what about yourself? Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Monty Pye from when the people walk He's a very, He's a very naughty, naughty boy. boy. <laughs> He's not the messiah. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, my, my review, uh, just titled Fabulous. Uh, by Holly Craig. So thanks for that, Holly. I, I don't know if it's Holly Craig or Craig Holly. Whichever way, thank you very much for that. And this says, keep up the good work, loving it. <laughs> <laughs> they just they do swear. When, how do you know they're from Wales, Dave? <laughs> I'm assuming it's Craig Holly. So <laughs> I could have gone with a Buddy Holly type of thing. <laughs> But we're, we're, we'll we'll decide they're going to be Welsh. This is going to be a great segment, Dave. We actually need loads of reviews. We've got quite a few actually looking at the reviews. We've got a heck of a lot, haven't we? Yeah, we're going to get through them. So we'll, we'll have to make sure we don't, uh, obviously, everyone who takes the time out, which we really appreciate, you know, has a unique voice. So we'll try not to do the same voice twice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I will not do that voice twice, Dave. Thank so, you. <laughs> <laughs> as only a friend would tell me yes now dave this week we're going into one of the 80s films that has eluded me my whole 39 years on this planet um and it's howard the duck and obviously i believe you've got some comic background on this masterpiece i have so but just drawing back the curtain a little bit so we discussed you know Shall we do something a bit retro and a bit rubbish? And I have to say, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the comic backgrounds, Howard the Duck first appeared in Adventure Interfere, issue number 19, back in 1973. And he was created by writer Steve Gerber, and, uh, and the artist was Val Mayerick. Now, it's really Steve Gerber. It's, it's really his um, 
brainchild, but but Val gets a, a co-credit on that as well. Now, he appeared at, really in, as part of the horror comics um, quite a lot in Man-Thing, and basically he became more and more popular with the fans, and he basically got his own comic, Howard the Duck, number one, um, a little bit after that. Now, in 1978, Steve Gerber and Marvel clashed quite a lot over creative control of that character. And it was one of the first cases where you really had that. So we had more and more of that through the years, but this was one of the first. And basically, it ended up with Marvel taking Gerber off the book. So Gerber in 1980, he basically filed for copyright infringement. I think, I don't want to trip trip over your bit but i think with a whiff of you know the fact that there was a film coming along and potentially a lot of money so that that might have uh, had something to do with the timing but there's no doubt that steve gerber felt a lot of uh love you know felt like it was his character now in the end he, he had to agree with the courts that basically he'd created howard the duck as part of uh work for hire so you hear this term a lot so and it's been a very contentious issue so people like jack kirby as well you know it's basically created most of the marvel universe but you know all the characters are owned by marvel they're not owned by the creators or or they weren't back at that time and they're they had this term work for hire it's like well we hired you and whatever you create we own so around this time you know gerber was quite annoyed by this and and actually worked with jack kirby to create this character uh, sort of based on howard called destroyer duck and then around that time just to add insult to injury so disney were also getting involved as well because of the similarities with donald duck and so, you know, they were going to file for a lawsuit as well and wanted all kinds of changes to be made to the character. So it ended up with Howard wearing some trousers. So a bit of a weird one, isn't it, Disney? You know, we, we want our uh, duck to have no trousers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yours can wear trousers. Um, but also just the way the character looked, you know, making his eyes a bit smaller, a bit close together and things like that. So these were all things Disney was suggesting to make sure that people wouldn't get confused between Howard and Donald. Now, again, obviously Gerber was very, you know, uh, privately annoyed by all of this. Now, in 1996, so years and years after, so way after this movie was created, Gerber pulled an absolute masterstroke as far as I'm concerned. So he was still obviously writing. He was in and around the industry. He didn't work for Marvel, worked for other companies. And he convinced Marvel to do like an unofficial crossover with a couple of books that he was he was writing them both. So the book that Marvel was doing was uh, Spider-Man Team Up. And Image were doing a book, which was Savage Dragon and Destroyer Duck. So Marvel had all editorial control over what was happening, obviously, in the Spider-Man book, but they had no control over what was happening in the image book. And the way he wrote the story, basically, they ended up, uh, they rescue Howard and Beverly, and then they send back a clone of Howard back with (laughs) (laughs) Spider-Man. So basically, at the end of this story, the the clone of Howard, the cheap imitation, if you like, goes back to the Marvel Universe and the real Howard stays in the image book. And I just thought, what a brilliant way to stick it to the man. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, it's a little bit of a convoluted backstory. And, and, again, he's probably, you know, he's very much a character from the time, from the 70s, you know. All the stories fairly fairly satirical, and and people, you know, probably wondering now, you know, if they're just being exposed to the character now, probably wonder what the hell he's all about. But uh, but no, quite quite an interesting one. So, Chris, how about the movie background? Yeah, I've got quite a bit actually today, Dave. Probably longer than the review's going to be, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it was directed by uh, Willard Hoyk. And it's starring, obviously, 1980s TV royalty uh, in Leah Thompson, 
uh, Jeffrey Jones and Tim Robbins. Leah Thompson, obviously, was Lorraine McFly. Who, uh, to this day, I still have a crush on Dave. Uh, Jeffrey oh Jones. We'll, yeah, we'll probably we'll get, get on to that. that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, <laughs> Jeffrey Jones, again, another one of my all-time favourite films, as I said in a few podcasts. He's Mr... Ed Rooney, otherwise known as the teacher chasing Ferris Bueller at Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And then we've got Tim Robbins, obviously, from the Shawshank Redemption as well, and obviously a lot of other things, as you know, either way of that, Dave. So it had like, quite a good, strong cast. They weren't household names by then, but Leah Thompson had made a name the year before in Back to the Future. So they, they felt that with a bit playing such a good part in Back to the Future, she deserved her own sort of leading role and leading lady role and stuff. So um, we went from there. The uh, film came out in 1986. It was originally going to be an animated film, but Marvel decided they wanted a live-action uh, film, and George Lucas is the executive producer. Now, George Lucas has to be signed from Lucasfilm to come and produce this film and make other films as well after it. Um, and actually, he was the one who suggested a live-action film using his special effects, you know, obviously from the Star Wars franchise and stuff, which mm-hmm. there is a slight nod when the two moons are visible, which is on um, Howard's like world, it's supposed to signify Tatooine out of Star Wars as well, at a certain angle and stuff at the start, you know, when he gets transported to uh, Earth. And to be right, fair, right. I, didn't, I didn't see that. I've just seen that through the um, research. Now, the way it was shot, they used a, 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 um, a technique called ultralight sequence, which was that hard to shoot that Tim Robbins and Ed Gale, Ed Gale was the guy who played... Uh, for most of the time, he played Howard the Duck, um, and they had to fly the actual plane in that scene. You know, around the uh, when they were flying around and stuff, mm-hmm. they had to actually simulate that, and they were flying flying it because they couldn't do it any other way with special effects, um, which I found a bit weird. Um, especially with George Lucas, but obviously George Lucas uh, to this day still acknowledges that this film wasn't as bad as what I'll get to in a minute as as what. Um, it came out by, and, and to be fair, it's a bit like what happened with Man of Steel last week, Dave, where it was a push comes to shove and they had to get something out. And this is why this film sort of was born, really. They were under sort of co- contract by the studio to actually get something out. So it's quite an um, interesting sort of deadline they were working to on this one. Now, uh, Lucasfilm built all the animatronics for the, for the um, <clears throat> public, you know, for the ducks and everything. Um, now, they actually got awards for the animatronics in this film, and it's about the only positive reward they did get. And I think a couple of the visual effects in the, the end battle as well with the Overlord and stuff, that's, that was praised. Um, now, I'm going to you know, love this, Dave, but when Howard's head becomes erect, shall we say, when his uh, feathers become <laughs> erect, that took six months, Dave, and some of the most uh, intense and... Uh, time-consuming tricks that Lucas have ever come across. Now, I, I do question, was it worth it, Dave? But anyway... Um... <laughs> they were working under a timeline, but they had six months to work on this utter yeah, yeah. throwaway thing. And, yeah. and there's plenty of throwaway in this. So, <laughs> you know, what they, they weren't under that much of a timeline. <laughs> no, it's awful. I mean, the, the voice of... Howard was changed after they'd finished filming it. It was Ed Gale, but because of the suit he had on, nobody could understand what he said. And what they had to do was, and he couldn't pick it up on the microphones or anything when they were in post-production. So the guy called Chip Zine came on and he did the actual voice. He had that sort of squeaky, whiny uh, voice, which he thought had replicated Duck quite well. But one of the lead puppeteers, Tim Rose, he had to stand at the side while all the scenes were being shot and he had to actually speak the lines. So the actors had an actual cue and mm-hmm. a dial, you know, something to play off the character because they said Gale situation was just totally. So it went against everything. So they said in pre-production, putting Chip Zine's uh, voice in was an absolute nightmare, Dave. Again, it all just added and compounded to the absolute um, mess at times of the production. Now Leah Thompson, obviously, as I said, coming off the coattails of Back to the Future, absolutely was petrified when this film got screened because. Um, she she had to take a job and took a role in a film that she'd previously turned down, a low-budget film, because she felt like her career was over because of such bad reviews. Now, Jeffrey Jones, who obviously plays the Overlord in that, Ed Rooney, um, he'd been in Amadeus the year before, so they were, like, praising him, saying he's a great actor, we want him in, and his career didn't really suffer then because he went straight to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but Tim Robbins did, 
And Tim Robbins had a bit of a dip for a couple of years after this film, but he was a real poison chalice for the actors. And um, Leah Thompson said there was just daft things that ruined the experience, like her hair. She kept her hair as her own. She wanted to wear a wig because she was going for a Madonna stroke Cindy Lauper look, which obviously mm-hmm. was around that time, wasn't it? Um, and it said it just took like two and three hours every day of doing a, a makeup and hair. And it just, everything was just so long winded and convoluted that it just was, it, she said she could look back now and say it was a great experience. These fans who appreciate the film, she said, but at the time it was one of the worst things she'd ever done career-wise. She thought it had absolutely decimated her career. Now, this is the best bit, Dave. The critical response. The six actors who played Howard got Golden Raspberry Awards for the worst new star. <laughs> How the look is at a 15% review on Rotten Tomatoes. That's on a 48 reviews with an average rate of 2.5 out of 10. <sighs> it's the lowest rated Lucas film production ever made. Um, it, the film actually got at least 15 Golden Raspberry, Worst Director Awards, Screenplay, Worst New Star, Worst Picture. <laughs> it got a Stinkers Bad Movie Awards. Um, it was awful. Now, it was a $37.9 million budget it took to make the film, and they actually made a profit of $1 million. Um, now, it was, it was, they actually thought it was going to be so successful. George Lucas convinced of it. They actually started pre-production on a sequel, which luckily, and thank God, never came to light, Dave, which is, Absolutely uh, amazing. And it still goes down in the top uh, 50 films of the most costliest flops of all time. Uh, absolute disgrace of uh, reviews and everything. So, uh, and that's it really, Dave. I think like, uh, there's not only much more we can say really, other than I think we just need to review this thing. <laughs> Isn't it funny about George Lucas? Because, you know, obviously for... The start of the initial trilogy, the Star Wars movies, he just absolutely captured lightning in a bottle. And he's just done so much that's rubbish. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the fact that he can get to the end of this movie, look back and declare how successful it's going to be, just has me questioned. Was, was Star Wars just a fluke? I've read stuff, other than the, irrespective of us doing the podcast, I've read that loads of times on Lucas, saying he's, as a visionary, fantastic, the puppet side of it, you know, the Star Wars stuff. But as a director and someone who's, who's got a leader production, he's not that good. And I, and it, it comes, this is just an absolute, we all make mistakes and there's always going to be one sort of, you know, skeleton in your closet you, you regret with life on whatever you do. But this is an absolute, you wouldn't even think it was the same director, Dave. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking, you know, when he he put the additional effects on Star Wars, he, he did a job and basically made the films worse. Um, there were lots of spin-off Ewok movies. There's things like Caravan of Courage I remember watching as a kid. It's just awful. Um, and again, I, I just... Obviously, the the prequels you know, were pretty, pretty awful as well. He seems to have had more misses than hits. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Do do you want to say a quick word from our sponsor? Of course, yeah. Today's episode, again, is sponsored by uh, the wonderful company, Studio. That's www.studio.com. If you want any headsets and entertainment uh, earphones, please get over to their website. Have a look what's on offer. Myself and Dave are rocking him as we speak, doing the podcast. We've had him for a long time. Our competition winner is absolutely loving him. Chris McLean out there. Uh, and if you use the password, uh, you know, if you use the code Comics in Motion Podcast 15, as in 15 at the end, you'll get 15% off at checkout. So give them a follow, get them on social media, and get buying their products, guys. Brilliant. So, should we get into our review? Let's go. So, uh, interestingly, we start off, and one of the things, when when Gerber got kicked off the book, uh, one of the things that happened after that was, you know, they started drawing Duckworld, which Gerber really wasn't happy about. And uh, But that's essentially where we start, isn't it? You know, and and there's lots. Uh, Again, when you mention about the movie and, and... being under pressure for the for the timing of it, they spend so much, and uh, you know they've created so many props to give us this uh, little 
duck world that's basically a it's like our world so you got all the posters and everything um but it's just all plays on on the duck uh, uh words <laughs> and i must admit dave at this point five minutes in thinking what the duck is going on <laughs> yep yep well going into this movie i was very excited <laughs> I was, spit, I was spitting feathers myself, Dave. Like, yeah. All day if you want. <laughs> but I, again, I was trying to think. I, I did see this at, at the cinema actually when uh, when I was a kid, and I, I didn't particularly enjoy it then. But uh, I must admit, on watching it now on this rewatch, it got to this point, and it was more of a just oh god, you know, yeah, all the little references and silly jokes. I thought, did I find that funny? At one point, maybe maybe I did, but, but I'm not sure. But yeah, so it, it's it gives us uh, a window into the into Duck World, and I tell you what jumped out at me: this is a PG film. There are a lot of sexual references in this. Oh yes, and so you know he's got he's just chilling out. He's got a beer. Uh, his flat, and you know, there's he's got an answer machine message from his duck girlfriend and she's talking about running her fingers through his feathers and you know that he should get right over there and and then so he he sits down with his beer and he he starts thumbing through a copy of play duck <laughs> and i'm thinking <laughs> think about it who who is this movie for yeah yeah uh, it, it was <sighs> obviously we've watched weird science and you know i absolutely slated it and and it's the tone of this film it felt like they were trying to be john hughes film with a bit of puppets and muppets type you know uh puppetry and stuff and i'm the same as you i i'm thinking i think it was just an 18 because i remember as a kid dave how the duck was always one of the trailers on the films that you watched. And it was always one of these dodgy karate films that I watched or something <laughs> that was a 15 or whatever. And I always remember the bit where he shoots across the floor in like that vehicle or whatever. And I never forget it. And I always used to think, I don't want to watch this rubbish, you know, like yeah. even then, and that we're going back to the gates. He's so he's never, I've alluded not to watch it because I knew from the trailers, I thought this isn't my sort of film. And I didn't know what to expect and within 10 minutes i thought oh my gosh if i could have had a dave horrocks voodoo doll you'd have been getting a few pins in it mate i'm telling you it was and not not for not for the want of trying i kept thinking with this world was just i just didn't think i understand it's supposed to be an alien and it's based on comic books i'm just thinking it's just gone from new york in his world to new york in earth and it just I just didn't get what was going on. I, when he transferred to the earth, I just thought, I don't know what's going on, and I don't actually care. I was thinking, this is terrible. <laughs> so it's just a good start then, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think, you know, one of the one of those 80s tropes, you know, the 80s movies, especially like, you know, the John John Hughes movies and that, just never seemed to miss an opportunity to, to have some naked boobs on the screen. And uh, obviously, I thought with with Howard the Duck, we we wouldn't get that. But uh, as Howard, you know, he's he's sat down in his chair and he gets we don't know what, but he's getting pulled by some invisible force, you know, so out of his apartment. And then we get that he's going through the different rooms and what have you. And basically, there's a a lady duck in the bath um, with with her boobs out. Now it was an interesting design because uh, the nipples <laughs> are over the feathers. <laughs> and I was like, "What the hell did I?" Because it's only it's on the screen for like a couple of seconds, isn't it? And I was yeah. Like, what the hell did I just see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you did message me saying we're going to have to talk about the duck boobs because it's very the way that scene happens it's an ant and deck Saturday night takeaway job they're just he's going through a wall after wall in him building yeah. after building and I was the same I was thinking oh um, what is this I, 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 what I can't think of is George Lucas thinking what what goes on in your mind for you actually think that the audiences are gonna take to this you've just had you know Luke Skywalker and stuff and Han Solo you've just come off the back of all that and it's still going strong even in 1986 and 85 and you're like 
what the heck is this? Oh, Dave, I was just like, oh, no, please, yeah, no. Yeah. It was just, it was unnecessary, and it was for laughs, obviously, but it just wasn't funny. I just, I found it quite a lot, quite disturbing, if I'm being honest. Well, again, just I'll, I'll go back to the original creator, Gerber. So he'd said that, you know, the, the joke around Howard is that there is no joke, you know, but the people who got control of the character and, and were leading creating this movie were like, no, 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 it's, it's a duck from outer space and he's on Earth. That's the joke. Yeah. <laughs> you just think, yeah, but it's not, it's not, if that's the start and end of it, it's not really funny, is it? You know, yeah. it's, it's quite a lot to make a, you know, a, a movie about, so, or, or not a lot rather to make a movie about. But yeah, I just again, I, I keep, I'm going to keep coming back to that, you know, timeline thing, and and uh, you know that they felt under pressure to get a movie out, and it's like, well, so you've sat down and and really thought and created all the animatronics for this female duck with duck boobs to be on the screen for two seconds, or. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely, and I can't imagine in the eighties it even it was well received stuff like that. It was just that it missed the beat completely, didn't it? It, it, it really awful. The, the only shiny light about the next scene, Dave. Obviously, he ends up on Earth, and we do come across mine and yourselves by the sounds of it. Boyhood crushes Leah Thompson, aka Lorraine Bain McFly, um, who is you know she's the singer, isn't she, in this band? Yep, yep. I mean, he has a little bit of a run-in with some local uh, 80s punks, doesn't he? And, you know, he's sort of running around and uh, get, gets a little bit terrorised. But, yeah, then he runs into Beverly. Uh, she's fronting her band Cherry Bomb and Leah Thompson. And I have to say, by God. <laughs> I know. <Don't laughs> she looks pretty amazing in this she might not have been that keen on her hair and and everything but you know forgiving all the 80s-ness of all the clothes and the hair and stuff she she was just looking absolutely amazing yeah and obviously going off man of steel last week she does actually play um, martha kent as well in the smallville series so she's followed me everywhere i've gone dave back to the future everything but yeah i i, I mean I, I must admit seeing her on stage doing her act and all this, I kept thinking this must have been done before Back to the Future. You know, knowing we're mm -hmm. about 15, 20 minutes in and it's pretty terrible. And I'm thinking, sure. And then I went online to look and I was like, oh, no, she's gone straight from Back to the Future to this. And she must have been thinking, what have I done? You know, like as I said in the in the movie background, she really had worries and problems while she was actually on set afterwards. It must have been terrible for all the actors. I mean, you know, they got paid for it, but career-wise... I kept thinking she, she didn't seem. She seemed younger in this than she did in Back to the Future. I don't know why her acting was was off and everything. I thought. Yeah, well, I, I guess the um, she. I mean, she plays. She's got all the fifties kind of uh, clothes and hairstyle, hasn't she? You know, so yeah. it instantly makes her look a little bit older in Back to the Future, and then you know she's made up to look much older as well, and then. Uh, it's it's the second one, isn't it, where they go into the future and yeah. um, she's got the old boob job and you made me get these things. <laughs> 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 Which yeah. so she doesn't look as good there, obviously, as as she looks here. But uh, but yeah, yeah, um, all hail Leah Thompson, just absolutely yeah. gorgeous. She's the only thing that saves this film, if I'm being honest. And she's the only thing I'm looking forward to coming on the screen, Dave, because, uh, yeah, and he, uh, the thing is, it's set up, I just think it's a bit weak. I mean, the character of Howard, he's played by a Gale, but a lot of the scenes where he's got to run and he's got to move around, they had to use child actors. They were going to use dwarfs, but they decided to use child actors. Now, because Ed Gale was slightly bigger. Now, I don't know mm -hmm. whether he's, he's five foot and he's supposed to be three foot one, isn't he, and stuff they say, we don't, when, the, when the police are looking for him and that. Yeah, yeah. So, obviously, he, he does look in certain scenes. He, he looks maybe just under five foot, so I understand that. But the karate scenes and the, the – oh, it was absolutely uh, – uh, Not dire. karate. Quack. Martial art, quack foo. Just like, what the heck? Yeah, I, I – it was just terrible, wasn't it? It was pretty poor. And, and she's obviously, these guys are fans, and we get introduced to him, and, and, and it's just like, oh, dear. 
ESPN, maybe. It's well, just, again, you know, old Leah Thompson's not very lucky, is she? And, and you know, it, uh, again, it, you watch back these 80s movies and you think, God, there's a lot of men who are quite rapey. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's a bit over the top. So, um, yeah, I thought <laughs> quite, that was all a bit much. Quite rapey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are, aren't they? They're, the two blokes and that because that's that's basically why you know howard jumps out of his little trash can and and declares that he's a master of quack foo quack foo which is i mean he meets her doesn't he? she then feels sorry for him. there's a bit of a, a bit of a love thing where she's like she feels sorry for the guy brings him back to the pub and and um well i don't understand dave i must have just lost interest in this the next day she takes him to see Phil Bloomberg, which is um, Tim Robbins into yeah, like the yeah. science. He's a paleontology, which obviously paleontology used to be dinosaurs and stuff, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm correct with that, R. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I thought they just gave him a, a label of scientist. Uh, <laughs> you know, so just generic scientist. It's like, oh, right, he's got a, light, a white lab coat. But, of course, you know, I mean, Tim Robbins, I, I'm surprised he had a career after this, and, and especially, you know, so great in something like Shawshank. Because, I mean, he, to be fair to him, he doesn't hold back with this, does he? <laughs> I mean, he, he fully goes for it, that weird over the topness um yeah i was i was i was a bit taken aback it's like really i, I kind of recognize you as a serious actor and you're just hamming it up big time yeah it, 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 it was just i don't know <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm lost for words. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess it, you know, so they go to him. I don't, I, I didn't pick up on how Beverly knew him. No, I didn't. That's what, that's what I thought maybe I'd miss something. I was watching it and it wasn't like I was flicking on my phone. And it just naturally went from her apartment to the paleontologist to the science museum where, where he worked. And I, I, I genuinely was thinking, I've missed some here. I've missed some sort of dialogue. I've not been paying attention yeah, yeah. to. You know, you know, because you're trying to understand. If it's a film you've seen before, like Man of Steel and that, I watched it again last week. Obviously, we reviewed it and that. But they still, you know, what's happening. You know, this stuff that sticks in your head. Mm-hmm. You know, you can follow it because I've never seen this film. I followed it, you know, from the get go, thinking I've got to watch it because there's going to be stuff that you might pick up on as someone who's watched it previously. Yeah, yeah. and just for just for my own conscience more than anything my, in my own mind. But I, I did, I, I'm with you. There was a lot of stuff with this, the story that just, it went from one thing to another and you were sort of, I, I do, we've mentioned this before. I do like it when you actually have to use your imagination to imagine them going from one scenario to another. Mm-hmm. If, it, if it moves the plot along and if it makes sense for you to use that bit of a mind, like you did, like we've mentioned with the comic books where that comic book thing, every panel's not step by step, is it? It's just, it's sections or timelines within the story. It might move it on an hour in one panel, and the next panel it moves on by two days or whatever. But this just didn't make any sense to me. I couldn't work out what was going on. Yeah, I think I think it's good where you have to use a little bit of your imagination, but I, I think it's a bit much, you know, to to imagine how does Beverly actually know this guy who she thinks is a scientist, and it actually just turns out he's a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so absolutely useless. And uh, obviously her and Howard have a little bit of a falling out. You know, Howard thinks he's been led up the garden path there and, and quite annoyed. He just wants to get home. Again, they thought this generic scientist would be able to help him understand how he got there. And then uh, he goes off to try and find a job. Yeah. Um, and what a job he gets, Dave. Um, well, again, I, I'm not sure what this was supposed. Well, I, I think I know what it was supposed to be. So basically, he goes to a. Uh, I can't think of a play on a, a duck word, but um, probably where <laughs> where the ladies exchange services for uh, cash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one day. I mean, I just thought that was so bizarre. Like you said. It's supposed to be a PG now. It's treading the line between a PG, Dave. If you've took your kids to see this in the 80s and they're under 10, I'm pretty sure you're going to be coming out going, I'm sure that's not appropriate. You know what I mean? Even now, I just, you know, I know the world's gone mad the way it is now, but we're a bit more liberal in 2018 than we were in 1986. And come on, there's no way that is acceptable. And, And literally, you've got people there going, and I know it's supposed to be a joke and... 
it just was terrible. I just thought it was a terrible bit of um it was just not needed within the film at all. And and he gets involved with this random guy, let's see, on his first day, doesn't he? He's obviously the guy who runs the uh, House of Ill mm-hmm. Review. And then he starts saying to him, you've got to clean up and all this. And then he he, he goes into some sort of mud bath, doesn't he? I don't know what it's supposed yeah. to be. And he just pushes him in it because he's pushed him in the water, anyway. When he's, he's in the jacuzzi, and he, uh, how yeah, he gets yeah. pushed in the jacuzzi when the couple are having a bit. And then he just goes in another room, and this guy's there with like a bra in his hand, and just I don't know, it was mud or it's supposed to be sewage. I don't know. He's just like, oh, this is terrible. And he just gave up, then he? he was like, I resigned, sort of thing, or words to that effect. And and he's sort of jobless again. He was just pretty. I, I can't. I'd love to swear, but I can't. He was just absolutely awful. Yeah, I, I, like you say, I guess you know from a from a storytelling perspective, I, I guess they're trying to say. He'll take any, you know, he's trying to take any job, and you know, even if it's a rubbish job, um, and give it a go. But some of the noises coming from some of the patrons were, again, not 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 PG appropriate, I wouldn't say. Yeah, yeah, not at all, not at all. You, you couldn't put this on now with your uh, eight-year-old lad, could you, and say to him, I watch this. You'd, be, you'd have too many questions to be answered, wouldn't you, to be answered. So, yeah, just interesting. But And then, obviously, he goes to the club, She's singing again, isn't she, uh, Beverly? Yeah. And he then gets into a bit of a set two with her manager of these, just like you say, these sort of lechy scumbags from the 80s and has probably one of the worst fights we've ever seen where (laughs) he he ends up with him (laughs) pinning the guy's earring to the bar. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. You know, it, it it was... it was just awful, wasn't it? it really, Pretty I'm, awful. I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying not to be a negative Nelly, shall we say, Dave, but I, I I was finding it hard, I'll be honest with you, mate. I really was finding it hard. So, I mean, just to take a, a brief aside there, I mean, again, the story is just weak, isn't it? Just, yeah. just everything about it. And, and again, at this point, I had a look at the... Uh, at how long was left and it, it was still ages to go and I'm like, oh you can't be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get your to blame, Dave. <laughs> but I, I know, I know. That's you know, we do these things for, for our listeners' entertainment, don't we? But it's pretty hard going sometimes. And th- this was definitely hard going. But um what I would say is the facial expressions on that puppet, on Howard, are still pretty good, I think. And and I think it holds up pretty well. Just those practical effects, because they they'd never do that now, would they? They they no. just have a, a CGI character, uh, yeah. like like you know when he appeared in Guardians of the Galaxy uh, mm. at the end there. But I, I thought I thought he looked pretty good. Um, but again, that and Leah Thompson being in it are probably the two positive things in the in the whole movie. But you know, having a compare, it's not as if it was a really good compelling story, and and the the effects just didn't really stand up to it. It's it just the story was awful and, and bland. But you know, so he he gets them out because the the manager's been you know basically fleecing the band. You know, keep keeping all the cash and and so howard gets them out of their contract you know so apparently it just it just takes a fight in a bar and just you know say release them from the contract okay and that's it um so obviously howard lets the girls know and you know they're all pretty happy he's a bit of a hero to them and you know kind of talk about him being their their new manager yeah and then and then what was really bizarre there's no mention of it but you know, Blumber, who's obviously Tim Robbins, he comes in and he's back on with one of the the, the singers or the backing singers or the guitarist in the band from nowhere. And he's, <laughs> yeah. he's going out with her. Oh, this, you know, we're, we're back together. And it was just like, what? Oh, because he's then saying, Howard, well, you know, I thought I'd lost you and all this. And he's like absolutely over the moon. He's seen Howard again. But I just thought that's too much of a coincidence. Come on. He's just hanging around. Like, they all seem to treat him with a healthy dose of disdain as well, don't they? You know, he's just like, oh, go away, you know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's bizarre. And like you say, just so over the top. I mean, you know, Matt Frewer from Generation X has got nothing on Tim Robbins here, I think. No, no, he's playing the absolute geek in a completely... To the to the max, hundred percent, Dave. Yeah, and and yeah. 
obviously he then introduces Howard and, and Beverly to like his two colleagues. We get introduced then to uh, Ed Rooney. Uh, you know, oh, we can't we can't skip over the suggested relationship. Oh, so, no. yeah. Yeah. Sorry, some, yeah. some of my favourite scenes in this bit, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Again, mostly centered around Leah Thompson being in little pants. Um, there were some wonderful artistic shots there that I, I appreciated and wondered, should I actually get the Blu-ray? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the you know, they're ball, basically yeah. both in bed and, you know, there's a lot of suggestion and that's where you get the, uh, the hairs on his head standing to attention, you know, for that for that gag that apparently took six months. Yeah. And, you know, again, this cross species, uh, intimacy is, is hinted at strongly here, isn't it? Before they just turn up because apparently the door's left open. <laughs> well, I, th- I think, I think in the wider scale of things, Dave, as well, is if it was, so let's, let's think of it logically. If it was a man kissing a female duck, it'd be, You'd be going mad. It'd be a big uproar, wouldn't they? But for some reason, women are just expected to kiss these like <laughs> animal men, creatures, aren't they? In these things, you know, Beauty and the Beast, things like that. I know they're all fantasy. But you just sort of think. Now, what you said before about there being child actors in this suit, I hope they were using a dwarf or an animatronic puppet for this bit. <laughs> Because if there was a if there was an eight year old child in there, then then that's whole new levels of wrong. Exactly. Well, I don't know. Weird science seemed to get away with it, didn't they? We kill the Brock. So yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, I just you know it's wrong because it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we both said that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. So terrible. Okay. So um, yeah. So so basically, you know, all the scientists turn up, and then we find out. You know, they've probably been the ones as part of this experiment accidentally kind of sucked Howard from his home planet and uh, dragged him back to Earth. So, so you know, he's got a lead. You know, he kind of wants to go down to the – it's kind of an observatory, wasn't it? Again, it, some of the science, pseudoscience here was a little bit of a stretch you know, yeah. uh, they were trying to basically just had a big telescope and, and somehow that, that manages to pull things into our into our planet. Well, well, they go to the laboratory, don't they? And then you've got the machine malfunctions, don't it? There's, you know, they think they can transport Howard back and then it breaks, doesn't it, basically, and malfunctions and we end up with... Um, Walter, I've got to call him Walter Jennings, which is you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ed Rooney. He he ends up becoming possessed with the as the dark overlord of the universe, don't he? And we see a bit of powers used and a bit of 1980 special effects, which I didn't have a problem with because the era. But I think, like you said, because the story's so weak, you're actually picking holes in everything, aren't you? You're like, oh, this is woeful. Well, what a when they get to, I, I was trying to think because they're at his apartment, and I was trying to think how because because they obviously go, th- there must be a little bit of a time lag because you know the guy who turns into the Dark Overlord, he's he's at the lab first, and when yeah. they walk in, you know there's a fella who's half burned down side of his face, you know, and and obviously in a lot of distress about what this accident that's happened, and they they kind of just nonchalantly walk in <laughs> yeah. know, there's all hell's breaking loose and it's like oh come on really you're not just gonna stroll in there you, you know you're gonna at oh, least acknowledge yeah. the fact that everyone's going crazy aren't they right. out. yeah sorry yeah it's like strolling in like nothing's happened it's like what's what's going on here but yeah, sorry i forgot about that yeah 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 so um so jenning he, he um he's he's obviously just been possessed and again these the jokes played a little bit too much where he's saying all this weird stuff and uh, you know they're in the car driving off and they end up in this diner don't they and you know he's he keeps turning into this he keeps coming out with stuff that this dark overlord's saying and, and they just say oh I, I, I don't understand what you're saying it's like Come on, they, they just played up on that a little bit too much yeah. for me. His voice was terrible as well. Dead whiny, wasn't it? Yeah. It was really, really poor. And then they get the thing, don't they, where he's, he's, they, they get into a, um, a truck stop, don't they? they go yeah. to something to eat. And Howard gets into a bit of a, a battle, and the, the chef 
you know, he's basically going to kill Howard and all that. And the overlord just starts basically, as I should say, Dave, as always, taking names. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that what they do in these, uh, in Cleveland? Is, is you know, if they have something that's a bit odd, they just all lynch them and, and strap them down and start <laughs> seasoning them and, and ready to <laughs> stick them in the cooker. I mean, it, it was a little bit, it was a little bit Muppets, wasn't it? You know, it was just, yeah. it, just ridiculous. You know, it's supposed to be kind of, all right, it's a duck on earth, but it's supposed to be a little bit grounded. And and I just thought that was just nonsense, the way that all played. Yeah, out. it was it was pretty poor. And obviously the overlord gets starts driving a truck, doesn't he? And he's ramming a roadblock and he starts he starts taking coppers out, doesn't he, and everything. But every time you pan to him, his hair and face is getting worse and worse. He's turning into sort of like the Walking Dead stroke with filler video, isn't he? You know, yeah, every time. Yeah. And his voice is getting dead white. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that's terrible. I think yeah, that was pretty good, that. That was pretty good, though. I've watched too much of the Walking Dead, unfortunately. Some will say <laughs> I don't. Uh, but, but no, I, I must say, Dave, before we get to, obviously, we, we sort of we, we flick through this one. We're near the finale bit. But I kept thinking, because I had no origin of what How the Duck was about, I kept thinking we're going to have a bit of a moment where he turns into some sort of um, super superhero, you know, like he's going to take some mm-hmm. potion or he's going to take something, knowing the origins of where the character briefly is from. And obviously I, I had no idea what the film's about, but there's nothing is there. He's not really, he's not a superhero as in he's got powers. I'm not saying that everyone oh. should have, and we know Bruce Wayne has and, and stuff like that, but I was just like, surely there's got to be something else to this than he's just a bumbling Idiot, basically, the duck. No, it's just, it's just an average Joe. It's just Joe happens to be a duck. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I thought that was even weaker because I thought maybe he's going to go up against the Overlord and take some sort of potion or something, and you know, give him a run for his money. But no, it, that just didn't happen. It was all played for laughs, wasn't it? It was pretty. I mean, in theory, you know, having a, a an everyman kind of stepping up, you know, against adversity and and. Saving the day, yeah, I could get behind that concept. Um, but just this was just executed poorly, so uh, yeah. so so you can't really. I mean, they you know, they they have a bit, they end up in the you know, the dark overlord runs off, doesn't he? He plans to basically bring a load of other dark overlords onto Earth, so they head back to the the observatory or where wherever it was that they held this initial experiment. And then just to basically have a flying scene in the film, I think, uh, you know, Howard and Tim Robbins end up in this little contraption uh, again, for no other reason other than to show it in the movie, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, they, they end up getting there. Um, and, and we're skipping over quite a lot of this, this last, cause, cause I looked and this whole finale seemed to go on for about an hour. Yeah. But it really did. It was the third act. But it was a full hour. And, you know, all of the the attempted jokes that were going on before were had gone, and it, it felt like a, almost like a different movie at this point. And, uh, yeah, it, it was, um, you know, they end up, the Dark Overlord comes out of, out of Jennings' body, uh, and that's where you get the stop motion, and it, it reminded me a little bit of Men in Black at that point. Yeah, you know, some of the some of the things you see in there, and you don't see that sort of animation anymore, do you? And it, again, it looks a bit dated, but but I kind of like that bit. Uh, it, yeah, it reminded me of the, the chessboard on Star Wars. You know, oh, like yeah. the, the yeah, characters. Yeah, yeah. That's what it reminded me of the way it moved and stuff. So you have got that Lucasfilm um, DNA there, Dave. That, that's I, straight away, the movement of it, I just thought of that straight away. I thought it's probably one of the ch- chess pieces off the board. But, yeah, uh, it was all right. It, was, it wasn't terrible, was it? Are we talking about the movie? <laughs> oh, no, 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 the movie was awful. No, the, just, the CGI thing. Yeah, the the, the stop-motion uh, yeah. Dark Overlord. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that was, that was fine. And, you know... Um, how it ends up with this little little uh, neutron disintegrator, doesn't he? And and basically he 
before all these dark overlords can arrive on Earth, you know, he destroys that. So he, so he does save the day, despite the fact he's got no powers or anything, and uh, you know, and and everything is wonderful. Yes, um, and Dave, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> But well, the only bit out of it where the geek came in out of out of me, the only bit where I actually was like, "Oh, I like that," was the end segment. Everyone's, you know, saved the day. Howard's the hero. We then pan to uh, Beverly Leah Thompson's band. She's on stage in this massive like auditorium, isn't she? Like, you know, yeah. a couple of thousand people. Now, bit of trivia: she actually sang all them songs, Dave, as did the, the other girls in the band, um, and they actually all the songs are her singing. And they actually did it as a band, so she actually practiced everything. She still got the Les Paul guitar as oh, well, nice. the red one, because she does still play. Did you not notice when Howard sort of stumbles and falls onto the stage, the clothes he was wearing? Uh, it was very Back to the Future, wasn't yeah, it? Martin McFly, and then he yeah. even grabbed grabbed the guitar with his teeth. So he definite absolute parody of Back to the Future, a bit of a nod to what she'd been in the year before and Martin McFly, the clothes, enchantment under the sea dance outfit he had on from the 50s, exactly the same, Dave. And I don't even have to look that up. I knew so. That's the only time the geek in me came out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And and I have to say, I mean, I didn't know it was was her doing the singing, quite honestly. I kind of like that song. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it wasn't bad, actually, was it? Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, in Howard's their manager, isn't he? So, you know, again, it's all happy at the end, and we get the, the cool little catchy song. So uh, that that's essentially how it all wraps up. A last bit of trivia, Dave. Um, we know it is Howard the Duck even now, but in the UK and the Oz originally, it was called Howard the Duck, a new breed of hero. I don't think that makes any difference at all, but I just thought I'd throw that one in there, sort of my little trivia notes. That rings a bell, actually. Yeah, really, yeah, that does ring a bell. I wonder if it was on some of the earlier trailers or something back in the back in the day. And what's quite interesting, actually, one last little thing is for the role of Beverly, we got Leah Thompson, but we had Paul Abdul, Kim Basinger, uh, Jodie Benson, Sarah Jessica Parker, all auditioned for that role, and and Leah Thompson got it. I bet yeah. they were all thinking after it came out, well, that was a bullet dodged. <laughs> And I tell you, who was going to play Tim Robbins' his, uh, character, Phil Blumberg, it was Jay Leno as well. Oh, my I mean, word. I know, exactly. But, uh, yeah, what a film. Now, Dave, we might as well go for the review, eh? Yeah, yeah. Got a good feeling about this one. Let's yeah, let's yeah. go for it. Yeah, I'm sure Han Solo said that. I think, Dave... It is me this week. Okay. So <laughs> it's going to be no surprise with this one. <laughs> <sighs> Here we go. So obviously, I've never seen the film. Like I say, alluded to it on the VHS he's had his kids. It was always on there as one of the adverts at the start. Genuinely knew it was going to be awful. I wasn't going to like it. I didn't check the review scores. I didn't check any of the Rotten Tomatoes stuff. I never do on any of this stuff that we review, Dave, till afterwards. Obviously, the stuff I know and, and I've seen, I know what to expect, but the stuff I've not seen that, you know, we suggested, like good old Generation X and stuff. Um, now, I've got to take a retraction on this, Dave, as well, and I'm going to say that at the end regarding some of my comments that I keep saying in the podcast. But there's no story to this. There's no idea of what i've got no idea what's going on the it's a 1980s film so yeah the duck suit the animatronics and that great um you know for its time quite advanced like i say they were praised for that uh, visual sort of thing on the screen i just didn't care and if leah thompson wasn't on the screen and that's only from my um crush on her from being a kid I really would have turned this off. If we weren't reviewing it for a podcast, I would have turned it off for our podcast. Um, If you've not seen it, please, for the love of God, do not ever watch it. Trust me on this. It is quite rightly, and I'm going to say this now, David, I'm going to stop saying this. This is 
the worst film I have ever seen <laughs> because I have said it every one and every one you say to me, hold my beer and give me <laughs> I cannot honestly see anything beating this film. We've had Generation X, haven't we? We've had Weird Science, but my God, I I enjoyed <laughs> going through them to a point. This is absolutely atrocious. Please avoid it. It'd be good for people who they listen to the podcast and want to see and agree with me and you. I love that conversation with people when they say, actually, oh, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. Whatever. And there is fans out there for this film. A lot of people say it was more harshly cheated than what it was, but no, it wasn't. It was tr- it's truly atrocious. So for me, Dave, it's going to the Phantom Zone with General Zod, How the Duck in a Headlock, never to be seen ever again. It's terrible. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> a bit of a shocker there. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I I think I said, uh, you know, going into this in, in the mid-'80s, I, I'd seen it at the cinema, didn't like it then, thought it was a massive disappointment. Um, but I think I had seen it probably when I was a little bit older, you know, again, you sort of think, well, I've got slightly different tastes now. Maybe I might enjoy this. I'm I'm pretty sure I watched it and thought the same. And then on this rewatch, you know, I just think, and, and it does have a little bit of a cult following this and I've just no idea why It, it could be one of those things like, you know, there's Nick Nick Cage fan clubs and stuff, and and people love the Hoff, obviously, uh, myself included in that camp. It, it may be an ironic thing like that, but I I just can't see other than the things as you said, Leah Thompson being in it. You know, it's quite a long time to sit through just for that. I I just can't see why people would like this. Now. I guess if you're a if you do have a kind of curiosity and probably too much time on your hands, I wouldn't say completely avoid it because it it is one of those fascinating things to me that you know there was a lot of money thrown at this, and to come out with such a terrible movie is is uh, is quite an achievement. So I I actually think watching it once is is probably not a bad thing. Um, but you know, you will probably never want to watch it again. And, uh, I, I include myself in that camp. I can't see that I would ever watch this again. Now I, I, it was one of those going into this. I kind of thought, you know, I wonder if there's some bits that like, you know, I'll show my kids, you know, just for, you know, like I say, I kind of remembered that the animatronics were pretty good. And, uh, but with all the adult themes in it, yeah, it's not, it's not appropriate to show them. And then, you know, so, so for me, I'm never going to watch this again. It is going straight to the Phantom Zone. And I don't think I've ever done that before because I sent Man of Steel last week to the Phantom Zone. So two in a row for me. I know. But this, this needs to be locked away, uh, sent into that, that void. Yeah, ever. I mean, as a subplot, and obviously everyone knows, and it's a great score day, by the way. Thank you. Um, I We do the trivia, don't we, on Twitter? And there's a bit of trivia that I've seen, and I wanted to mention it, and it's just come back to me, if you don't mind, Dave, is George Lucas, was when this film was being made, right, talk about putting all your eggs in, in your basket, and I said, didn't you, he resigned from his position at Lucasfilms because he wanted to co-produce this, uh, executive produce this, and then get into doing other films. He just built the Skywalker Ranch, right, complex, at a cost of $50 million because of off the back of Star Wars, right? So he was heavily, heavily in debt. And when this film, he thought this film was going to be a success in getting back in the red, right? Again, uh, back in the black, sorry. Back in the black, back in the red. Back in the black. And when it bombed, he had to start selling stuff off. And a bit of uh, trivia, and he sold off the CGI part of Lucas' uh, films, which was to his very, very good friend, CEO of Apple, Mr. Steve Jobs, who then lost his job at Apple, and that became Pixar Animation Studio, Dave. Right, right. So uh, I know Steve Jobs bought into it, got sacked from Apple, and then Pixar, it was all around the same time. So it all, one thing wouldn't have happened to another. So just thought I'd drop that in there, but it shows how much faith George Lucas had in, in Howard the Duck, and it was totally blind faith, let's say. But um, it don't matter now. He's a billionaire, he? off the back of Star Wars. But 
You're yeah, living yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's, uh, he's not. He's doing. He's done all right, Annie. But <laughs> you, you do have to say, you know, the level of delusion <laughs> must be pretty high with him. You yeah. know. So yeah, it's just just a puzzle as yeah. to uh, as to how he can do things that are so good and so bad. That's the one. That's the one, Dave. Now, obviously, I did have a little pun about this film as well. We've done our review scores, and and basically, it's something that I'd mentioned uh, a couple of times, Dave, privately, is one of my favourite shows is Alvida's Aim Pet. And for this thing, I love the podcast. Me and Dave talk about what we're going to do and all this stuff. You know, we're not breaking the fourth wall, as, as probably you all know. We decide what we're going to do, review. We have to review it. And then for me, the conversation with, with something like this, the conversation we have regarding what we're going to review, the podcast, which you've just done, which I love, absolutely love, but the middle bit, I absolutely hated. So what I said was, the pun was, it's like having a curry, Dave. You have a curry, sometimes it's better just throwing it straight down the toilet. And I wish that <laughs> that's exactly what we've done with this film. We just cut the middleman straight out and gone straight to the podcast because I think I'd have got more enjoyment just reading the, the actual wiki page and how the film went because it was just... <laughs> So, so it's not only the Phantom Zone; it's the it's the toilet in the Phantom Zone. Left runs at the runs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So, Dave, before we go, just want to thank our sponsors again, Studio. That's www.studio.com. Get over there if you want a headset, headphones, or any entertainment products um, for listening to music, films, podcasts, obviously, especially the Comics in Motion podcast. If you use the uh, code Comics in Motion Podcast 15 at checkout, you get 15% off all orders. Dave, it's been an emotional journey today. What plugs have you got for us, mate? Yeah, so I'm going to plug the Grassroots Coachcast. So that's where Ben and myself talk about youth soccer or youth football coaching. And we're back to a, a weekly format now. So if you're interested in that stuff, then then get across there and, and give that a listen. Chris, how about yourself? Yep, well, we've got the Chat Footy podcast, which is um, myself, you, and Ben, obviously from Grassroots, talking every week about football. So if you want to get over there, if you want to get involved and come on the show, talk about the weekend's premiership and sort of world news on football, if anything comes to light. Uh, we're on Twitter, at Chat Footy, or on iTunes, at Chat Footy Podcast. And, you know, get involved, give us a listen, give us a review. Um, and also my vlogging channel, CPod78 Vlogs on YouTube. Get on there if you're into travel vlogs and general lifestyle vlogging. Um, now, Dave, what a week we've had. <laughs> and I think it's only right that you should lead us out today, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, let's get the duck out of here. <laughs> quack, quack. <laughs> you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, do you, mister? Whoa. Duck. It's Howard. Thank you. Howard. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beverly. Uh, listen, uh, would you like something to eat or um, drink uh, milk? I could put it in a bowl. Oh, Dal, I don't drink out of bowls. You got a beer? Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. No. Bill, you've got to help us. What are we going to do? Nice ducky. Me, Phil. You, Howard. We be friends. Ugh. Undoubtedly, one of Earth's greatest minds here. Oh! Hey, Phil, don't talk to him like that. He's just as smart as you are. Oh, now I'm really depressed. Highly intelligent. Perhaps even... Wait, that's it. We're about to see if subject has any abilities we don't have here on Earth. Any, what? shall we say, mm -hmm. superpowers.